Paul Roberts, also a Medford resident, is a retired corporate communications executive of the electronics industry, and he devotes his time now to his favorite subject, birds, primarily birds of prey. In fact, his wonderful essay in our book in, is entitled Praying in Mount Auburn, the Cemetery and Raptors. And praying is spelled not P-R-A-Y, P-R-E-Y. Paul is our ornithologist. Whenever there's a question about bird identification or anything else, it's always ask Paul. In 1976, he founded the Eastern Mass Hawk Watch, which he led for more than 20 years. He served as editor of Bird Observer for several years and was chair of the Hawk Migration Association of North America and still serves on the board. He received that organization's highest lifetime honor, the Joseph Taylor and Maurice Brown Award. His lectures to bird clubs and te teaches, he lectures to bird clubs and teaches courses for Mass Audubon on hawk shorebirds and waterfowl. Paul is the scholar of Buzz Ruby and their generations, those famous red tail hawks of 185 Alewife. Thank you. Let's introduce Paul Roberts. I'd like to ask you a question first. How many of you here are bird watchers? Okay. <laughs> Secondly, how many of you have been to Mount Auburn? Why? That's one of the interesting questions that the book addresses. So only a few are birders, and most of you have been to Mount Auburn. And that's one of the things that makes the book so interesting. If you're a birder, you go there, and you're hoping for a big day, and you hear 22 species of warblers. I was ruined for life one of my first weeks there because I walked in, and I had two of the rarest warblers you could have in the state within 15 minutes. And I've never seen the two together again in the same day or the same year. I could if I really worked at it, but it was an incredible day. <laughs> and then you go in there, and the winds were off the ocean. It was raining in Connecticut, and the birds are in Pennsylvania. But you and 300 other people are in the cemetery at 6 o'clock in the morning looking for what you know is not there. <laughs> now, that's not too bright. But what happens is there you are in one of the most beautiful garden cemeteries in the world. And my kids, even when they couldn't identify a bird, knew going in the azaleas, the rhododendrons, the flowering horse chestnut, the spectacular trees. It is a truly garden cemetery where many of the trees are labeled and you will not see them in Medford. <clears throat> then secondly, as you get from Dee's uh, essay and some others, there are incredible people buried there and you never have heard of them. But when you go, where are the damn with birds? God, there's nothing around. Oh, look at that gravestone. That's really weird. What is that? The Scottish Rites? Wow. And what it says. Did you ever hear of this guy? I never heard of him. But he must have been pretty good. Look at the money they spent on that. And wow, that was, you know, 130 years ago. Well, you really had to work hard to find out what that person was, particularly before the internet. Realize some of us here were already at our maturity when the internet developed. So if you wanted to find out who that guy was, who the guy was who started doing Fruits of North America, you really had to work. So what this book gives you is not a potpourri, a smorgasbord of stories. Some of birds, mine is all about primarily raptors. Uh, some of mammals, but a lot of the really interesting people that are buried there. Like the story of, of uh, Edward Booth and John Wilkes Booth. If you don't know that story, I'm not gonna tell you. <laughs> Buy the book. But, it's like I learned things from, from Dee's essay 
that, wow, I didn't realize this was done that way. I know about Audubon, but I didn't know about the uh, domestication of the strawberry, which is spread throughout Massachusetts as an agricultural crop, or the development of uh, the, the fruit of North America. A lot went on in the Boston area that you just don't know about. And I've learned a lot from the book, so I will heartily commend it to you. My little piece is, is on, on birds of prey, and particularly on how I learned to see hawks at Mount Auburn when you didn't see them very many places, period. And so I went for the warblers, and I saw them, but I found the hawks, and not the red tails that John writes about, uh, because there weren't red tails there yet, at that point in time when I started. Red tails are a relatively recent phenomenon. And part of what has happened with Mount Auburn is it has become a gated community, a Garden of Eden, for a variety of raptors that go to live there year round. Red tails did not breed in eastern Massachusetts when John was born, that far back, that long ago. <laughs> You couldn't see a red tail. Now, he's actually younger than I am. But uh, red tails lived primarily in the western part of the state, in the old dairy farms, etc. And as those old farms grew over, there were woodlots and open areas, and that, that uh, diversity of habitat was perfect for red tails. They didn't go near the cities. Those were ugly, dirty places filled with human beings. And so they stayed out there. But those forests started to mature. They became unbroken forests with few open areas. And they need broken habitat to hunt their prey. They're not a forest hawk. They're a broken habitat hawk. So what do you do when you're home? is taken away from you when your food disappears. Well, we built something called the Interstate Highway System under the Eisenhower administration. John's too young to remember that. But we built these corridors and cleared open lands between forests. Perfect habitat for red-tailed hawks. The red tail started moving to this habitat and occupying it. And they came right down something called the mass pike. 